Hi, it's Gadget UK here again. As you can see, this time we're looking at a Neo Geo. Uh, I'm not sure how that's stuck on there. Um, but yeah, it's a uh, 1FZ. Just a bit of tape, I think. Stuck onto the uh, ROM there. Uh, now, this is the one that uses a donor board for my original uh, MV1FZ repair, actually. We took the C1 chip off here. So the one that's on here has got a fault. The Player 2 start uh, input doesn't work. That's the only fault with that chip. Um, someone had previously had a go at a backup RAM replacement on this. You can see the, the backup RAMs have been swapped out there. Um, a wire, someone's messed with the HC32 chip there, the OR gate. So, yeah, and, and from what I remember, when I first got this, I tested it to check the C1, and it was given a backup RAM error. So, it might be repairable. That's the interesting thing. Uh, you know, you might think it was a bit crazy removing the C1 from my board, swapping them over when all this has got wrong with it is a backup RAM fault. But the fact that this came from Xeon uh, Z well, on the Neo Geo forums there, and he'd already, well, I presume he'd already had to go trying to fix it. Um, I'm guessing the fault is further on into the board. It perhaps isn't around this area, but it might be something he's missed. I don't know. It might not be him that actually did this. It might just be a board in his, his collection there that he's using for spares. Uh, I borrowed the VRAM off this previously. Um, I think it was when I was trying to get my four slot up and running. Uh, I was waiting for some VRAM. So, yeah, I borrowed the VRAM. So, I did socket that up. Um, now, if memory serves, I thought I damaged a trace when I did that, but uh, there's no signs of a wire or anything on there um, and I'm guessing I wouldn't have just stuck the socket straight on so maybe my memory's incorrect there I'm not sure um, but I thought all this we'll get the uh, diagnostics BIOS in there SMK Dan's uh, Diag BIOS um, I'll connect this up and we'll just see what's happening now I'm guessing we're going to get two errors we're going to get a backup RAM error and we're going to get a VRAM error now I think I've got some uh, chips I can uh, put in there um, but then if we can get rid of the VRAM errors will hopefully then just be left with the backup RAM error I can then uh, dig into that and see if I can fix it maybe in a future video I might do what I'd uh, talked about when I did that uh, MV1 episode repair there, my old one it was a crusty old video my videos I think have improved hopefully as uh, time has gone on but that video was pretty awful uh, back then I was working with MVS boards on the carpet which is an absolute no-no um, I can't believe I was stupid enough to do that to be honest but it's 30 odd, 30 years since I've been in the industry, you know. So there could be some damage around here, maybe a pad or something's not connected somewhere. These certainly need reflowing, they look awful. Um, but yeah, we might look out. I mean, in general, it doesn't look like the battery uh, caused uh, too much damage around that area. Uh, the C1 perhaps just needs a bit of a reflow. It was put on there pretty hastily when I originally did it. But from what I remember, it worked after I swapped it you know, swap the, the faulty one back on here. But what I might do, I might revisit this chip in a later video. Um, I'll take a CPLD and uh, do a mod that was uh, I talked about when I did my first MV1 FZ repair there. And uh, there'll be a lot of wires because there's something like 11 address bits or something need to go to that CPLD. Um, and I'd need to run the uh, data connection that comes out of this to the CPU through the CPLD and that under certain circumstances i.e. when it's trying to read the player to start, route it through the CPLD else just pass the input straight through, you know, the chip output from here straight through to the, the relevant data pin on the CPU there but that's totally feasible but it would be a lot of wires, you know, you'd have at least 11 for the uh, ad uh, address bus there I think, uh, one for the inputs from the controller and one to to the output of the you know the data bus um, yeah it could be messy it might not be more hassle than it's actually worth um, the main thing is if we can get this board up and running with regards to the backup run of the video it will work as a, a test board you know because player one controls there work fine probably need to recap and it's got all the original glue strewn over these uh, caps here uh, we might be able to do that in a later video perhaps so the back plane's looking pretty tidy there uh, and it's kind of no surprise um, some of these boards will have a lot more use than others but in general you tend to find that these boards only have had you know a couple of different carts in at any given point in their life there you know um, you know this may have had one game in there from the minute it was um, put into service and then uh, never swapped out but if you line that correctly it should just push on there like that so yeah you might want to use some deoxit or something or clean up the contacts with IPA but uh, yeah that's in there pretty well now so I'll swap out the ROM 
So you've got it all connected and powered up there. You can see I'm using a uh, cheap uh, arcade super gun here, her uh, Mark IV. Uh, ATX power supply, SCART cable going to the TV. So there's no video RAM in there at all at the moment, and it's not detecting that. I'm guessing it gets stuck on the first error it encounters. So, I mean, I'll stick a couple of uh, 5814 chips in there, whatever the RCX ones, or the Sony ones, um, just to populate them. But we might get a problem with the VRAM yet later, I'm not sure. But I think the next thing I'll do is try and focus on the backup RAM issue. So the next thing I'm doing is just a quick check because those RAMs have been swapped out before. Um, it's just checking the connectivity. So the easy ones to check are the address and the data bus because they're just all in parallel. So what I mean by that is if you see pin 1 uh, and all these pins down here are all address lines all the way down to here. Uh, and then we'll do some of the data the bus connections here but it's going to be the same thing it should be in parallel. Data connections up there, a few address lines up here. So if I measure from pin 1 we should get a join to all the other pin ones on the other three SRAMs. So hopefully you can see what I mean. If we measure from pin one there to here, we've got a short, a short, a short. And that's what we're checking on all these address and data lines. So we're on pin two now. Short, short, short. And if we just do that for all the address lines and all the data lines, that will rule out a majority of the connections. Once we've done that, we can look at the uh, chip selects and write enables and things. So a correction there with regards to the data bus. Uh, these two uh, are in parallel, and these two are in parallel with regards to the data bus connections, but the, all of the address bus connections are in parallel with all of them. Um, the write enables and output enables and stuff are not, uh, they're all driven separately, I think, by different things. I think that this down here is prim primarily used for the uh, uh, backup RAM. So we've got a wire here. I thought this was connected. It's not. It's just floating uh, down to one of the connections here. So I think the next thing I need to do is have a look at the schematics um, and try and work out, um, you know, how this HC32 is used to uh, connect to these two backup RAM chips here. But the interesting thing there was I would have thought that this would have booted up regardless of backup RAM problem, but it's not doing. So there may well be another issue actually, and the whole backup RAM issue could be a red herring. Um, there may well be some of the faults somewhere on this board. I think the other thing I may do now is just clean up with uh, some uh, IPA and a cotton bud the flux around here actually and I may reflow these um, at some point soon. So about an hour later first thing I'll say is that crazy wire uh, serves no purpose it's just not needed at all uh, and what I've done here is I reverse engineered this it took me quite a while actually because the schematics I'll show you they are absolutely atrocious. Bear in mind this is expanded. I mean, you can see, okay, you've got some pin numbers, 11, 12, 13, 1, 2, 3, and you can kind of guess that from the looking at the pinouts of a 74HC32. But I mean, look at this here. What's that? BRAM WEU, I think. BRAM EL, yeah, upper lowest. So, I mean, it's pretty hard trying to make sense of that. But I mean, look at the chips as well. I mean, look at this. You're trying to find where the BRAM pins are here. BRAM O E U L. Yes, yeah, so you can just about read it. But pin numbers: 13, 17. I mean, what's that there? <laughs> Looks like 66. I don't know. It's impossible. Um, so you know, using a combination of these three pages and taking readings from the board and this diagram which relates to a 2 slot, uh, 2F um, I came up with this, now it's different to the 2F the gates are in different order but the logic is the same there um, so there are a couple of things, now obviously this is really this is not a proper diagram, I need to draw out a proper diagram which I'll, I'll stick up at the end of the video just for uh, and a, down below it, uh, you can download it uh, just to help people out so what you've got here is the 74HC04, which is uh, this chip here. Uh, that's a question mark in my mind at the moment. Uh, I'll need to check with the Logic Probe. I did look at this previously with the Logic Probe, just briefly. Uh, but nevertheless, that could be a source of the problem here, I think. Um, feeds into uh, an OR gate here. Yeah, trust me, the R OR gates look like uh, not gates or some of the way I've drawn them. Uh, well, they've not got the dots on the end, but anyway. 
One of the inputs comes from a, a leg on the transistor actually, there's a transistor on the underside of the back, backup battery area, uh, it's marked uh, C2712 on the silk screen and I think it's going to the collector um, and that same pin goes to pin 20, sorry yeah it's, this is not how you would represent it, I just needed to extend it later on. So yeah that connection there goes to uh, the collector I think of that transistor but at the same time it also joins to pin 20 on RAM 3 and RAM 4. So I think that's the chip select I think it is. So that's that dealt with. Uh, now the right enable, um, and again if you just follow us through the output of that gate goes into another gate. Um, the C1, Neo C1 pin 14 comes in as a second input to this gate and the output provides you right enable for RAM 4 uh, on the pin 27. And up here the B1 pin 93 comes into both inputs for this gate here uh, and the output goes to the 4990 on pin 12 so that's kind of independence if you like uh, and then back to the C1 again the Neo C1 pin 98 comes into the input of this or, uh, or gate here and the output of this one is also joined in as an input here and the right enable then comes out to RAM 3 pin 27 so that we know I've proven all of that but then that left a pin uh, well left two things left this is a question mark the 04 maybe there's a fault there because bear in mind it's got a new HC32 which we think probably works uh, it's got two new SRAMs which again no reason to suspect they're the faults I have checked the address and the data bus connections on those SRAMs no issues there so the only pin that leaves uh, remaining is the output enable uh, now the output enable you can see here, I just uh, again I had to do some probing around to try and find this. On RAM 3, the output enable, pin 22, goes to pin 13 of the C1. Looking at the diagram, I think that's correct. So I would suspect it's going to be somewhere near there for the uh, other RAM, RAM 4, on the output enable, but I can't find connectivity at all. So it would seem that uh, RAM 4, uh, this is RAM 4 down here, uh, sorry, uh, RAM 3. Yeah, sorry. That should that should say that should say RAM four there, not RAM three. RAM three is this one here, uh, and I can't find a connection between uh, pin twenty two. And I'll show you in a minute. But the pad has been uh, pulled off there, so it's clear that that there is some damage there, um, and that might be uh, the cause. So I need to work out uh, which pin on the C one here is supposed to connect to pin twenty two um, on RAM three. So I'm going to just work out where the output enable pin uh, on RAM 3 uh, connects to on the C1. I'm just going to tear this down. This was uh, one that was working. I removed the battery from it when I received it, give it a good test. This was this is my spare. Uh, so I'll need to remove the plastic housing and I'm just going to do some connectivity tests um, to try and find which pin on the C1 it goes to. Well, that wasn't the news I wanted to hear. It actually goes to pin 97 of C1 and it is connected. So it would appear we've got connectivity there, despite the questionable connections. So that just leaves me thinking, okay, what could it be? Um, with the C1, I don't think so, because the C1 I know works. Um, I mean, there's a, well, there's a chance I could have damaged it when I resoldered it back on there, but I seriously doubt it. I think that C1's okay. The SRAM's, mm, not sure. Maybe someone swapped some from another board and thought they were okay, but they're not could just be something as simple as that but I'm inclined to think it's not that um, the 04 might check that on, that on the logic probe next I can't remember what an 04 is, is it a not gate or is it like a NAND or something I'm not sure so I'll look up the date sheet for 74HC04 uh, get the logic probe out and we'll just check that so that 7404 does seem to be working, it's inverting um, well I've only seen it a single state, I've seen it with a low input, outputting a high. In the meantime I thought I'm just going to inspect what closely, you can see someone's put a, a replacement cap on there um, of the through hole type, so I'll remove that, I'll stick an SMD cap there, it's just a 100 nanofarad probably. Um, I'll make a note of where that is just in case actually, in case it needs to be a different size. Uh, but I'm just going to inspect around, you can see like we've got some damage there, we've got broken traces, I don't know, I need to inspect that. Um, but the other thing I'm going to do is remove this black uh, glue stuff, you know, it's like the foam that was on the underside, which was stuck down with glue. Uh, and it can become conductive, I've had that before in other things, I've seen it in hard disks where you get like a foam like that, that's designed to just uh, isolate, but when you get it over a component like that and it starts to melt, 
with age, um, it can conduct. So, uh, I'll, yeah, I'll rule that out. We've also just done some comparisons there, measuring the circuit here, some of these uh, diodes, these diodes here for the battery charge circuit. But in particular, that transistor down there that's used for the VRAM. Um, and that's okay, it measures exactly the same as the other one, and you can see there's a bit of flux on there. Um, so I suspect someone's swapped that out to try and resolve the problem. I mean, they might not use the right transistor, that could be the case, but the fact it measures identically in relation to, to the three pins there in all directions makes me think that the uh, transistor has nothing to do with it. So what does that leave? Well, still the 7404, despite the fact it's it's uh, you know it's outputting a high when there's a low, uh, we don't know whether it's constantly outputting high. That could well be the problem. But the other thing with this is, you know, with a normal BIOS, you'd expect a backup RAM error, not a screen of garbage and a watchdog, um, which does suggest there's something else going on here, actually, a second fault, not just the backup RAM, or something that's causing a red herring, you know, it's causing a backup RAM error, when there isn't actually a backup RAM error. I think we're going to get the hot air onto this, remove this chip, and I'll swap out for my one known working spare. Uh, I'll have to order some more of these 62256 chips. Um, I think I swapped that previously. There was an, another HC32 on here. Um, the damage here was already done and the wire was already there. Uh, I think so. I think that's why it's got the small uh, size chip there because I think I had one spare and just looking through my spares I haven't got that anymore. I'm pretty sure I swapped that over when I first got this. But this the RAM was originally swapped by somebody else um, and someone else had attached a wire to the, the uh, HC32 there. Uh, I haven't fitted that little cap, I tried it without that little cap, you know, someone put a, a through hole cap on the underside. So I'll stick a, an SMD uh, 100 nanofarad cap on there, I did compare to the other board. That's another good thing to do, it's always a good idea having a working version of the system you're looking at, because you can just compare. So I've got the 100 nanofarad cap there, just added a bit of flux, uh, held it in position with the fine tool, soldered one side then the other, so I'll just clean that up and then we'll remove that uh, chip. Yeah, as you can see, that's not too bad. It's not as straight as I would have liked. It's perhaps a bit nearer to the left-hand side than the right-hand side. But the main thing is, it's got the proper sized cap there. Uh, it's not through hole, uh, and it's nice and tidy. So I'm doing this off a surface where heat could transfer. Uh, soldering station, or desoldering station, I should say, set to 350. So it's going to take a couple of minutes, this. Maybe a bit longer than it took on that N64 cart there. Uh, funnily enough, the same type of chip, but the PCB was super small on that one, super thin. These are quite thick. Uh, I mean, they're only double-sided as far as I understand, but there's quite a few layers, you know, thickness there for the ground planes and things. It's uh, they're pretty thick boards. There it goes. Come up on one side. completely off, there we go, just move that out of the way, where it's not going to interfere. So we'll clean up the uh, pads with a bit of uh, flux and solder braid, and we'll then get a replacement chip on. Might let it cool down a little bit first, because that's going to be super hot as it is now. Be careful when you do this. I watch some people using the solder braid. What you don't want to do is pull the solder braid away without the iron uh, having heated it sufficiently because you will just rip the pads straight off as the solder braid attaches itself, or the desolder braid, I should say, attaches itself to the pad. So you do want to take your time, be super careful. That should do. So there we go, that's not too bad, it's in position. All I need to do is just tack one corner, then the other, and then we'll drag flow the rest. Get some solder uh, onto the tip there, uh, and just dab into these pins, just like I did on the uh, N64 uh, memory cards video. If you join any pins together, you could just use a bit of flux and the solder braid to unbridge them. That side's not so bad. I might reflow these other chips and things as well, just because I don't think you can tell, but yeah, much cleaner job there already. I never rushed that actually. Bit more solder. And we'll do the same on this side. Yeah, bridged. 
few pins there. Uh, do try and uh, press the chip down as well before you uh, commit to soldering, but it's fairly flat actually, so I'm alright. And inspect with a magnifying glass and just clean up any uh, anything that needs cleaning. So that made no difference whatsoever. So we can rule out the rams, I think. Unless unless that's the upper, but I don't think it is. Looking at the uh, pinout for this, this connects to the upper address bits on the CPU here. Um, it's got to be pointing towards RAM 4. So the connectivity is good. The RAM we think is okay. So the last thing I could think of was to look back at the uh, backup RAM enable, uh, the output enable, and as you can see it comes from the, the HC04 there. Um, interestingly enough it looks like the pin numbers are different there, I can't... Yeah, the pin numbers on this diagram are confusing me. Um, as far as I can see it's like pin 2 uh, is the output and pin 1 is the input. That doesn't seem to make sense with this. But I did just do connectivity between this chip here and the 259. Uh, now is that a 259? I don't know, you can't read, it looks like 358 or something, it's crazy the print on these. Um, but in any case, yeah, it connects to the 259 and that's the latch, uh, and I'm guessing that's this here. So it would seem to have uh, either an input or an output to Shadow, whatever that is, and what on earth does that say there? PAL? Is it PAL something? Something to do with the palette? I'm not sure. Um, but in any case, I'm suspecting if the O4's not the issue, could be this. So I've ordered a 74HC04 and I've ordered a 74HC259. Um, so we'll have a go at uh, swapping those out I think. In the meantime I'm just going to do some connectivity tests on this 259 just to make sure we've not got a bad connection there because that could be the issue. We've got a bad trace or something coming to that 259. Even though it's connected okay to the uh, 04 which I've proven um, it could well be that it's not latching in the right address or something. You know we've got an address bit missing or something like that. I've had a look round that with the uh, Logic Probe there. The three address inputs are pulsing, the data input is pulsing, which suggests to me that the four address lines that are connected there are not an issue. Um, I think we'd have greater problems in the system if there was a problem with an upper address bit, if I'm completely honest. Um, and uh, the connectivity is there, you know, with regards to the other pins, the shadow output and the that one to the power to whatever it is, that, and that ultimately uh, gets split and feeds into the 04 there. It's all correct, so the 259 is what I've got my uh, bets on. But in the meantime, I thought I'd just clean up uh, the board here. Can you see? Those are the two pins I've just uh, given a light going over with the fiberglass. Now, these are, I've cleaned these with an eraser and IPA before. It just won't clean up. Can you see how bad those are? Just have a look at the state of them. They're horrendous. So, yeah, I'm just going to go over them all like that. Um, it's the same with these test pads down here as well. They're a bit uh, fuzzy. So I've got a replacement 7404, so I'll have a go at removing this chip now. It's a bit of a smaller package. It, the interesting thing is I think it's uh, SOP14, or I thought it was SOP14. That's what I've ordered, uh, and it's turned out a smaller profile. It's a bit like the HC32s I've used on these before. It's like a size smaller, but the pads are quite wide on these, so fitting it shouldn't be a problem, I don't think, in theory. It'll just about fit on there. Uh, I don't think the 04 is going to fix it, if I'm completely honest, because it's driving the output enables on both of those chips on the backup RAM there. So I would imagine that you'd get a fault on the lower as well as the upper. Uh, I just find it a bit strange, but we'll rule it out anyway. It's uh, a cheap component, um, and if it's not this, uh, I don't know what it could be. I mean, other than the 259 down there, what else would cause uh, a problem there? I mean, the, there's another way of looking at it, and that is the fact that the diagnostics seem to stop after you get a fault. So, like, when there's no VRAM on here, you don't get a VRAM failure. It stops at the VRAM failure there. So it could well be that it's testing the upper VRAM bank first, uh, and that's where we're getting the failure. So it may well be either this chip or the 04. Uh, I guess the other thing I could do, which would shed some light, is get the logic analyzer onto it and see what's going on with the output enables on both chips that would be uh, a good way to save myself some time here there you go, it's lifting now, can you see that? just carefully move that out of the way should do clean up the pads and get the new chip on there 
well whilst it hasn't fixed my problem, um, I'm seeing a change in behaviour. I don't know if you can see that, BRAM unwritable lower. And it's consistent. And I know the work I've done there is good. So, uh, yeah, I'm not sure how that's had a bearing on changing from upper to lower. But now, it would appear that the upper's okay. Um, well, it's failed on the lower. Maybe we've got a problem with the lower and the upper and it's just failed on the lower first, I don't know. Um, but at least now that's shifted my attention to the other chip as it ran three, I think it is. So I got the logic probe, I'll check uh, the pins around RAM three, just to make sure we've not got bad connectivity there. It could be the SRAM, because that's the one I've not swapped out here. It's still got the one on that came on this board that had been swapped out by someone else. And again, we don't know whether it was a good RAM. I suspect it could just have an hour RAM fault. That might be all that's wrong, that RAM chip. I think out of interest, what I will do, now I've got it to this stage, is just try it with the original BIOS, just to see if we get the standard backup RAM error, because you know, before, I don't know that I showed you, we're getting blocks and things, it's really weird. So that was indicating to me there was more than just uh, a backup RAM fault. It'd be good if we got past that. Oh yes, we've made some positive progress, because we are now just getting the backup RAM error there with the normal BIOS. So, uh, mm, strange how that 04 seemed okay, but swapping it out has given us a change in behavior there. You can see the colors are a bit odd there as well, which makes me wonder about the palette, you know, maybe the 259 has got an issue. So I've not probed that chip yet, I'll do that in a minute, but the nice thing now, we, we are making some positive progress here, this is really good news, because now I can hold down A, B, C, D, and it goes into the test menu there, when you, you power the thing up, you know, the diode bias. Um, previously that wasn't happening, it was like doing a watchdog, I'd get like a white, it'd flash white, 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 every half a second when you held all four buttons down. So there was definitely something questionable going on around that 04. Um, I mean, I have cleaned up the rest of the board at the same time. Maybe we had a particle of solder somewhere. It, that could have been the issue. Maybe there's nothing wrong with the 04. I will test that 04 independently at some point. Uh, I really could do with getting a TTL tester, but it's not the hardest thing to test on a bit of breadboard or something at some point. Um, so it would indeed seem to suggest that all we've got now is a RAM fault, you know, the, the actual RAM chip itself is the issue. I think I've got some 62256s somewhere, brand new ones, some Lion Tech ones. So I might just uh, swap out for a work, good known working brand new one. Uh, controller's working, that's a good sign. So let's try the VRAM test because this has got some replacement VRAM on here at the moment. And I'm not sure whether that VRAM is good actually. Well, that's a good sign. It's just passing. Fantastic. Uh, that means I can now test some of the VRAM chips I've got here as well. So we'll hold ABCD down to stop. I mean, it's saying passes. Has it gone through the full address range? I'm guessing it has. I'm guessing that's the, the number of passes in total. So let's just try that one, 32K. I think you can, uh, yeah, passes. You can hold A to determine whether it's passed or not. And it has indeed passed. So the VRAM is looking good. All four buttons. Pallet RAM, let's check that. D -d 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 expected passes. It says, uh, how do you do this then? Yeah, so have we got a fault there? Pallet address A8, A12. Uh, actual 1010, expected 00. And we've not got a pass. So that would indicate we've got a pallet RAM fault, actually, I think. Yeah, we might need to get some pallet RAM for this. I mean, that would certainly fit with what we saw when you powered it up with a normal BIOS. You know, the fact the colours were sort of weird. Uh, that would indicate a pallet issue. So, uh, let's just try that again. Yeah, we've definitely got a pallet, pallet issue there. I wonder if that 259 is the suspect there. Mm. So we can do the controller test, uh, left, right, up, down, A, B, C, D, select, start, yeah. But I'm guessing if we swap to, if we do that again, and I'm guessing if we go to controller 2, we just connect controller 2 up. So A, B, C, D, looks like D's not working either, select, yeah, start, we lost D. That could be a problem on the uh, board itself, actually. You know, it could be the resistor capacitor network there. Could be a trace. But yeah, we're missing D and start, actually. Let's check the calendar. Yeah, 
Yeah, so that's looking good. Let's uh, try changing the pulses. So we've got A, 1 hertz pulse, B, 64 hertz pulse, C, 4 kilohertz pulse. Yeah, that's looking good, I think. Colour bars, yeah, that's looking alright. So looking at the AES schematics, just because it's, it's clearer, uh, and the section to do with the, the VRAM and pallet RAM and stuff is identical actually, it's just the backup RAM that's different. I still need to swap that out, I'll do that next if I can resolve the pallet issue I think. Uh, it needs swapping out of that anyway, I mean look at the solder points and stuff on it, it's got some bent pins and all sorts. But you can see the one there looks pretty tidy actually. Uh, I still need to tidy that up a little bit, I can do that later. Um, yeah, that's not too bad. There's a bit of a dull point there that perhaps needs a reflow, but in general, when I swapped that chip out, it's, uh, it's pretty good. Uh, and I will have to investigate what's going on with the D button on the second player, but I'm not that bothered actually, because we do know the second player doesn't work. So using the AS schematics there, traced uh, through to where the, the address and the data connections go, and actually it seems to primarily connect to the, the B1 here actually. And I've just gone through each of the address lines and uh, trace them to here uh, and you might wonder why because even though it's a data problem you know the the fault we've got is that I think was it 1010 coming back as a value which would indicate a problem in this chip and a problem in that chip uh, now it's not like the same data bus is writing to each of these therefore one bit on the data bus could be an issue you've actually got a 16 bit data bus uh, from this chip I think uh, if memory serves so the likelihood of it being a data bus problem is zero uh, pretty much and it's similarly the chances of both chips failing you know I did think about that yeah it's possible but very unlikely you know you'd expect to see different faults at different addresses not the same value coming back at the start address of each of these so then I start thinking okay maybe it's writing uh, oh you know it's writing and then when it's reading, the addressing's going wrong. So that was why I then went to check the address lines, and all the address lines are connected. It's not like we've got one address bit missing between these, because the address uh, buses on these are joined up, they're in parallel. So you can check, you know, A0 it will join to this one on A0, A1 to A1, A2, A2 to A3, etc. You know, they join all the way along until you get to, like, I don't know, A12, A12 to A12. Uh, and again, let's say those are completely joined here, no issues at all. They're all down this side here. I think the address connections there. Um, so that left me wondering what on earth could cause this. You know, I speculate in the 259 here, and I thought, okay, well, let's let's just check this. I'll have a super close look. So I inspected all around it. I don't see any damage. And then, you know, it's a routine uh, thing that I do with things like this is okay, we've inspected the top side. Bear in mind, we can't inspect under chips, but generally, you don't get corrosion and things like that in those sort of places. But uh, flipping over the other side here, I thought, let's have a look round. And uh, I'm not sure I can find it on the camera now, but there's a scratch trace. I'll find it and I'll zoom in and show you. Yeah, super hard to find. It's just took me three minutes to find the blooming thing again. Can you see here? Uh, I might have to put you on macro, but we've got just like a little nick there. And this sits pretty much on the, if you flip the board over, if we look where this is, it's pretty much sort of around this area here. So I'm suspecting actually that that's all that's wrong with the pallets and I think we've got a, a cut trace there somewhere so I'll uh, yeah I'll get the fiberglass panel on that, that wherever it's gone I've lost it again um, and uh, clean it up and just just have a really close inspection see if it is actually broken there were a few like that there was uh, a few up here can you see these I've tinned these there are a few up here that were like they're like these ones over here just lightly scratched and I had to use the fiberglass pen just to expose a bit more, just to determine whether there was actually a break. And in this case, there wasn't. You can see I just tinned them. They look super tidy. Uh, but there's definitely what looks like a breakdown here somewhere. Um, and it does look uh, much more like an actual break. It does look like a gouge to me. So unfortunately, it wasn't a bad trace. I'll show you. I just tinned it. Um, but we'll go back to uh, the backup RAM now, I think. And we'll then go back to the pallet stuff when the 259 arrives because that's what I'm thinking. I've ordered one, uh, we'll give it a try and we'll just see if that fixes it. It does look, uh, I don't know you can tell, but some of the pins on the top there look like the pad has actually been lifted off the board previously. So we may find that uh, a pad comes up on the top side there. Uh, I'm just warning you before we get this off because I suspect that's what's going to happen. There we go, it's starting to come up now. key is just to not force it. 
it starts to lift like it is, it's lifted on one side, we're at a bit of a weird angle, there you go. Not force it at all, just let it go with the flow, you know, kind of thing. There we go, that's it. So not too bad. Uh, clean up the uh, pads, get the new chip on. And as I say, one of the pins up here, or two of them, looked a bit flaky to me. But it could just be um, the pins on the chip were a bit bent, uh, making it look like the pads had been broken off when they hadn't. Well, it's annoying. I had to use some uh, different flux, actually. It says it's Amtec. There's some China. There's no way that's uh, Amtec, I'm sure. Um, but yeah, as you can see, it's gone on okay there. So we'll connect that up uh, and give it a try. Round and round we go. Um, I'm suspecting that the other SRAM has now got a problem, possibly. Um, I need to work out, was it the upper or the lower? Um, I mean, it's saying there, BRAM data, 5555, five, five, you know, 45s. But it's at a specific address, you see, this is the thing. Address D0004, actual 0855, expected 5555. So it's that uh, first bite there, you know, the first, I don't know, is it the upper or lower? I always get mixed up as to which way around the displayed. Uh, but yeah, that first one, we've obviously got a problem. Uh, a certain address, and this is the thing, you know, it's like you get past one error and then you've got another. So whereas before we had no um, output enable or whatever going on, I think I've solved that. I think I solved that with the, well, as soon as I swapped that 04, that seemed to solve it. And then we got a step further, and now I'm left in the realms of thinking, is it the new SRAM? Because, you know, it was pretty cheap from China. It might be faulty. Or is it the old SRAM, the first one we swapped out, which was I thought was working. I think that came off for working MVS, so mm, I'm not too sure. Well, I'm going around in circles with this. So I've replaced that SRAM, and then I'm getting a BRAM upper, not writable, which I think, if I remember right, it was this one. I mean, it could be that one. It could be that these chips I've got here that are supposed to be brand new Liontech ones are faulty. Uh, it wouldn't surprise me because they were cheap. But before I do anything else, I think we'll sidestep because I'm, I'm going around in circles here and the pads and things on there are not going to last much longer, I think. Keep removing and swapping those over. In the meantime, I thought we'll remove this because the one thing that we've got in common here is the backup RAM and the pallets both have this chip in common. And I can't help but wonder if it's a red herring and we're going around swapping the RAM here like uh, there's no tomorrow, when all we've got is a problem with the 259. And to explain the thought process why I think it's the 259, you can see you've got this pallet uh, bank uh, output here and the shadow uh, RAM, presumably, some sort of shadow uh, feature there. Um, but also the BRAM enable comes from one of the outputs there as well. Um, I'm not sure what this is for here, some system, something, can't read that. But I'm thinking that this is not latching correctly. So just like that last one, it should only take uh, a few minutes, I think, to get this off here, hopefully. I mean, it'd be really nice if this at least solves one of my problems. If it doesn't, um, I'm, in the rel you know, I'm in the dark, I don't really know where to go from there. It would be a case of having to do some logic analyzer captures, but my logic analyzer is really not up to the job with something like this, you know, it being 16 bit, I've got 16 channels, I mean I could monitor all the address bus at the same time, but that's not going to help me reveal anything. Uh, I mean I could use it on things like this small chip here, but for the most part I think I would struggle. There we go, it's coming off. Oh yes, all tests passed. So yeah, I was right to follow my instincts there. Continuously swapping those uh, backup RAMs around would be a crazy idea. I do think that the chances are the S all three of the SRAMs I've had on there at different points, you know, the two the original ones were on there and then the one I swapped out, which I ultimately swapped out for one of those LionTech chips, um, were probably okay. So I mean, I'll keep those, I'll perhaps test them at some point. Uh, I don't really like sticking chips on and off, on and off, on and off of boards because, uh, you know, you can damage them just with heat and stuff, handling, you know, unless you're taking proper ESD precautions and things. But that's great. I mean, that's solved two problems there now. Backup RAM problem's gone and the pallet RAM problem's gone. And we can test that the specific things there. Let's go into the pallet RAM. I think you have to hold the button down. Yeah, you do. Passes 28. So you can see that that's the normal behaviour there. 
but the fact that it's uh, passing is the main thing. So all four uh, again, VRAM, again hold down A, passes three, passes six, so let's come out of that one. Let's do the 2K VRAM. Yeah, that's all good. So I think we're ready to test the game. So I'll connect the uh, cart bridge up to the back and we'll stick a cart in and see what happens. So we've got a graphics issue there, ZMC2, would that cause that? I'm not sure. Um, could also just be the slot, we could have a, a trace damage there, uh, leading to the cart connectivity. Uh, but the main thing is it's passing all the diagnostics, so it's got to be something like that, I would think. Actually, I'm thinking it's just a dirty connection, because you can see with Ironclad there, it's looking pretty good actually, I don't think we're missing anything. Uh, I'll just switch it off and on. When I first switched it on, we had some speckles on the Neo Geo logo flickering in and out. It's that stable now. It was flickering a bit before. Um, so yeah, I think it's just a dirty slot. I think this is fixed. Uh, we haven't got sound at the moment because I'm using the jam, the jammer, you know, the super gun thing here. Um, I'll just connect some headphones just to make sure we're getting sound out. But I think we can uh, call this one a success. Hopefully you can hear that. We are getting sound. So I'm going to clean up the slot uh, now. I'll clean up the uh, edge of that PCB because you can see that's looking a bit dirty as well in a minute. But the main thing is just I want to get some IPA uh, and just carefully go in and out of the uh, thing here. Deoxy is perhaps a much better thing to do or to use on something like this actually uh, because they are going to be slightly oxidised, especially when this has been in storage with this separated from the main unit. Um, but that's all I'm going to do. The other one of these I uh, have, the other one I use myself, well there's a few of these, I've got three or four of these, one more I've said now. Uh, two or three of them I've not got around to looking at yet. Um, I've also got some other ones in the loft as well that I mean to look at at some point, so I might. Uh, this might motivate me to go and uh, have a look at some of those. Never even tested, uh, you know, got them for spares and things like that, but uh, never even uh, as much as powered them up to see what, what's wrong with any of them, actually. Some of them might be fixable, but others might not. The things you want to avoid are the ones that have been over voltage, you know, where someone's connected up, uh, you know, a different power supply maybe, and they've wired up the plus 12 to the plus 5 and things like that. That does happen. Clean the back while we're here anyway. Uh, not that it's really important, but we can inspect. I can inspect for any uh, dry solder points and things like that. It's not going to do it any harm. So we need to do the main slot now. Uh, I think the way I'm going to do that is just fold some paper uh, and just slide it in and out carefully. And you don't want it too thick, you know, that's not as thick as a PCB. Uh, and what you don't want to do is go sideways, you just want to go up and down. If you go sideways, you're going to uh, damage pins and things. You know, you'll bend them to the sides. Yeah, you want to go up and down like that. And this isn't too thick, it's uh, a bit too thin actually, if anything, because I can push it in super easy. But that's all you need to do. And try not going side to side, as I say. After cleaning that up, as you can see, it's fantastic. It worked first time there. Uh, I thought I was going to have to clean the car out. I thought maybe it was the car that was dirty, but no. It was definitely the uh, car slot, uh, you know, all the connectors there, the interconnects that were dirty. It's perfect, absolutely perfect. Well, I worked out why the D button wasn't working on player two. Can you see? It's uh, come away there, the solder's loose. So I'm going to reflow all of these here. So I'm a 259 arrived for the uh, other board. Uh, I've shown lots of removal, I haven't shown much solder on this video, so I'll film the uh, soldering this chip. Uh, again, it's the same size as the uh, other component that was on the other board, you know, so it's smaller. Um, and it'll just about fit, if you set it dead centre there, the uh, pads on each side will just about reach. It's a, a very tight fit. Uh, I'd appreciate in the comments below if you... Uh, I'm familiar with the sizings here because you know it's many years since I was in the industry um, and salt surface mount stuff only sort of started to come in just as I got out of the uh, industry actually um, and I'd assumed that this was like SOP 14 is it an SOJ 14 I'm not sure um, you know it's this these are a bit larger than these ones that are marked SOP um, so yeah I'm confused I don't even think you can get them anymore in that size I don't know yeah, look how much smaller that is. That's got to be uh, pixel perfect aligned <laughs> in order that you don't uh, miss the pads actually on top and bottom. 
it's uh, yeah, it's not really the right size chip, but it will be okay. Uh, I'll show you. You know, we should be able to get that to make a good join on there. And I'll show you the pinout for this in a minute. It is just a latch. The 259 is just a latch. So you've got, I think, uh, four inputs. Well, three, three address bits, one data import. So four, four, well, three, three bits, if you like. Um, but then you've got uh, eight uh, outputs. Uh, and you can set any of those individual outputs using the addresses, you know, for the, the input there. And the data pin, I think, latches it. So you can set, you know, specific bits uh, there. I think that's how that works. Um, it's quite uh, useful, I would imagine, in a, a number of places, that type of chip. And it wouldn't have been the hardest thing to test with a logic analyzer, actually. Um, it would just literally be a case of just looking at the uh, three address bit inputs, the data input, and then looking at what's on the outputs. Um, and since we had a problem with the backup RAM and the pallet, I would suggest it wasn't just like a couple of bit output bits that were a problem. It was probably something internal to do with the latching, actually set, you know, um, the, the, the memory, if you like, you know, st holding the state of certain bits and things there. I think that that's perhaps what's wrong with it. Yeah, when you go for that size chip, there is no room for mistakes. You can see how tight that is. It's on the very, 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 very edge of both the top and the bottom pads. It's just literally touching. But as long as you get a good flow of solder there, uh, there's no reason why it shouldn't uh, be okay. Yeah, so I managed to uh, anchor one corner. Uh, and the way I had to do that, actually, was just to uh, put the tool on here like this and hold it at the same time as trying to uh, solder the actual pin. Should do, we don't need a lot. Uh, yeah, I'm not using the chip kick flux here, as I mentioned earlier, it's run out at the moment. So I'm using this uh, awful, uh, well, yeah, fake Amtec flux, I think it is. So I'll just get a bit of solder on there and uh, I'll tack this corner up here, actually. Because then we've got the uh, two opposite ones. That's it, I think. Yeah. Drag up and down uh, these, actually. It's not too bad, just get a bit more solder. Yeah, the, it's interesting how flux behaves differently, different types of flux. This one uh, is just like a really liquidy sort of thing. And by the time you've finished, it's just all runny, like runny liquid all over the board. When you use that uh, chip quick flux, which I do recommend, it's really, really good stuff. It's more sticky at the end. You know, you get like a gooey, sticky, um, toffee sort of thing to clean off. Um, it's really weird. With this type, you can almost just dry it with the cotton buds. It's almost like no clean. It's bizarre. Maybe that's what it is. Maybe it's uh, supposed to be that way. It's been designed that way. Uh, we'll just go over those one more time, I think. And then I'll give you a close-up. Yeah, that's not too bad, I don't think. Um, I'll just get you a bit closer so you can see. See that? That's not bad. There might be a bit too much on this corner here. Anchor, you know, the corner points uh, tend to accumulate a bit more solder. The pads are a little bit larger on the corners. But... Uh, once I got rid of all that flux, that should be okay. Uh, I mean, it was a shame, really. What I should have done in retrospect, I shouldn't have interfered with this board. Because this board, as you can see, if you look at the solder points on it, it's good as new. This is a really good example. It's interesting, that sticker there that says YM2610. I don't know if you can see that. I can get around there. Um, but, yeah, it's um, in super good condition, this board. There's no marks or scratches, or corrosion. It's super clean. It's a super clean example of this board, and this is one of the reasons why I kept this as a good working spare. But I did borrow the 259 because I couldn't wait for the uh, the other one to arrive. But hopefully it should still look all right when I've cleaned that up. Uh, and I'll just show you, actually, if you stick the cotton bud on there now, just watch this. Uh, now with Chip Quick, uh, bear in mind, like I say, it'd, be, it'd just stick to this and you'd have a gooey, horrible mess. But you can see the cotton bud just absorbs the, the flux. It's almost like a no-clean flux. Um, Try to avoid getting it all down there, it's down there already. Yeah, so I'll have to get the toothbrush into that area, I think, in a minute. But you can clean most of it up just with a dry cotton bud and then go over with the uh, uh, IPA and another uh, cotton bud and stuff. You can see most of that's gone. So there you go, after cleaning with a couple of cotton buds uh, and using a toothbrush, you can see that's pretty blooming good actually. So I'll get the uh, dag bars on this board and we'll test this one now as well just to make sure this is still working. And on this board, you'll note that I've uh, soldered the uh, ground strap there. 
because there was a gap, it was floating. It is better if this crystal's grounded on the one I've said. Um, as I mentioned on my uh, Neo SD uh, video there, I forget which one it was, um, one of the problems I had with my MVS, and maybe it's because, I don't know where the location I'm in here, um, it's pick, what's picking up noise, you know, interference. When that, when that crystal is grounded, um, I don't get any CRC errors on uh, the Neo SD, whereas before I realized that was an issue, I was getting uh, CRC er errors intermittently, uh, very regularly. But that stopped completely the minute I grounded uh, my crystal on my 1FZ. And I tested the same theory on the other few boards I've got, and the same thing was true of all of them, which is why I've uh, started grounding these wherever I see that. I mean, that's what that strap's there for, is to provide some mechanical stability and an electrical uh, ground to it. But, um, as you can see, you know, it's not joining. Sometimes they've got a blob of glue there, so you might have mechanical stability, but you've not got it grounded. Um, the one down here for the clock, you know, the, the standard, the real-time date stuff, it doesn't seem to be important. But I'm guessing things like that could be affected just the same, but it's, uh, yeah, it won't cause any issues. So one of the things I would point out as well, is some of these MVS boards, the pins can be super long. Can you see this? Um, I think those are the, on the amp. Yeah, they are, because the, the screws are there for the uh, heat sink. But can you see how long those are? Super easy for those to get bent and to short. Uh, you'll see in various places around the board, look at that one there, that's crazy long. Um, you get quite long extended legs. Um, more often than not down here in the control area, there's some quite long legs, but I think they seem trimmed on this one. Uh, on my other one, lots of those were shorted. That might be why I ended up with uh, a failure on the uh, start, uh, the player two, uh, on that original board there. Um, yeah, so do inspect these before you power them up for the first time, just to make sure you've not got any short pins. You know, there are some really long pins in places. And the other thing I would say while I'm here is there are some variations. You know, you can see here there's a serial number uh, etched into the uh, PCB there. You, know, you can just about see that. Um, and this one's got the silk screen. My original MVS uh, 1FZ has not got a silk screen, I don't think. It, it, they vary. They vary so much. I don't know whether it's because they were manufactured in different places, whether it was uh, just mistakes at the factory, whether it was cost cutting or what. Um, and you might be wondering why I seem to have a, an affinity or a pot, you know, a favouritism here for the 1FZ. Uh, that's interesting. It's got a, a suffix or something there. Can you see that? Is that MB2? 1FZ. MB2, like it's a revision or something, I'm not sure. Um, but yeah, so why do I like the one I've said? Well, this has got a lot in common with the last revision of the AES. It's got the same chipset. You've got the uh, LSPC uh, A2 graphics chip, uh, the B1, Neo B1, which does some of the graphics stuff as well, palette. I mean, there are some differences. I think the AES has got a chip this hasn't got, and I think this has got a chip the AES hasn't got. But for the most part, you'll find it's got exactly the same chips, uh, more or less, as that AES. I think it's got a different pallet ram chips. It's got these ones instead of uh, the the uh, you know larger uh, you know dip type ones. I think the longer dip ones for the pallets. But everything else is pretty much the same. Um, so it's useful to have these as spares to be able to interchange between the AES and the MVS. That's one thing I like about these. If you go back to the old AES, the one I've got, uh, and I'm, yeah, it kind of doesn't make sense because the AES I've got is the older version, but the um, yeah, the older version of the AES has got the three large quad flat packs, the Pro chips there that you get on some of the older MVS boards. Um, but that was one of the reasons I like these boards. I like the the way that everything separates. You've got a lot of discrete ICs. You know, I had that problem with the controller inputs, and it was easy just to swap out the C1. If you look at some of the very latest um, MVS boards, you know, the last in the series there, they're almost like, not a one-chip solution, but they're not getting far off. Uh, I think uh, the one, the, the, one of the late, later ones has literally got one main chip on there, and like a Yamaha, and, that, and a couple of RAM chips, and that's about it, I think. And I don't like that, uh, you know, single-chip uh, type design or consolidation of chips into uh, single ASICs and stuff. I much prefer it when there's uh, a spread of them like this, because if you've got a no number of spare boards, the chances are the faults you're gonna get are gonna be randomly distributed, and you're always gonna be able to start to make uh, a number of working systems out of one faulty system. So we're all connected up, and as you can see, all tests passed. So we'll test that one with uh, a game as well. But as you can see, no graphical issues. I'm guessing we've got sound. I mean, this board was working before, I've tested it in the past. No issues at all. So I'll test a few games out on it now. Uh, I've got uh, the Supergun wired up to a speaker, uh, as you can see down here. So I'll switch it on. 
and hopefully we should get some sound. It's not going to be very clear. There we go, we've got some. I'll have to adjust the volume of the pot on the board and I'll show you. Yeah, the pot's just down there because it's amplified out. That's, uh, that's loud enough. So because I'm using the uh, official BIOS, I'll have to press the coin button on the uh, super gun. Let's just have a quick go of this. We'll try uh, another game in a minute. I think one final thing we'll do, we'll run the uh, sound diagnostics, I'll show you that. But it seems okay to me. Some of them are such nice graphics and the music there. Sounds awful, I must be there, seriously. Sweet, yeah, working fine. And if I remember rightly, my Bang Bang Busters, which is, uh, well, was a bootleg bubble bobble, let me switch that off, that's super nervous, uh, has the uh, biodiagnostics uh, BIOS there for the uh, M1, because as well as the chip you've already seen there, you know, the main one that swaps out the SM1, whatever it is, the main BIOS there, uh, that you can uh, use a 27C1024 for, you also need, if you want to test the sound, you need uh, an M1 ROM on a game cart. So I used my puzzle bubble originally, but then when I swapped this, converted this to uh, Bang Bang Busters, I think I left the uh, switch on there. Yeah, you can see that. It's just a jumper, so I can swap that over. Okay, I've got to pull it apart. And if I reassemble that now, when I boot it with the diagnostics BIOS, I can hold a button down, I forget what it is, it might be C or something, I'm not sure. And it'll test the Z80 out. So I'll swap the main uh, BIOS on the board there for the diagnostics ROM. And if we switch it on, you'll see, it just does the normal test. But at the bottom here, it says uh, Z80 testing was skipped. To test the Z80, hold down button D and soft reset. So if I hold down button D and then do select and start, that'll soft reset. Now bear in mind, like I said, I've got Bang Bang Busters in there, but the M1 ROM, is currently the Diagnostics M1 ROM. Uh, so, you know, I've got a jumper on there to switch between Bang Bang Busters M1 and Diagnostics M1. Uh, if you want to know more about how to do that, all test passed there. And you can hear that sound, just if you do hear a sound there, it's doing some extra checks, all to do with the Z80. Uh, and if you want to know more about how to do that, just check out my Puzzle Bobble Bootleg, I think it was, uh, video. Um, I may have covered or talked about it a little bit on the Bang Bang Busters conversion as well. They're old crusty videos, uh, but nevertheless, I'm sure I covered it in one of those two videos. Something else I'd quickly point out on the 1FZ official diagram here. Uh, you'll see that the gates are incorrect. This is referred to here as a 74 hc 32 That's a NAND. That's, that's incorrect. That symbol is incorrect. They should all be like that there and all. So, yeah, that could confuse you if you're looking at that. So, in a similar way I did to the other crystal on the other board, I've uh, grounded uh, the uh, can there. It's a bit easier on the other type because you have that strap going over and there's lots of places you could scratch the solder mask there or put a wire nearby to solder onto but yeah, on these low profile ones like this it's a bit hard. It's pretty corroded the top of that. Uh, I did try cleaning it but it's, uh, yeah, it's not coming off. It really could do with a new crystal at some point perhaps. So before I close this video up, uh, I'll just uh, show you the board. It's uh, looking a lot better actually. So you can see, you know, these chips came out pretty good here after they were done. I did reflow around here. We had a, a pad uh, short there. That might have been from when I originally swapped out the uh, 74HC32, I don't know. But uh, you know, you can see there's a good join. It's, um, it is a good join, it's just a bit of the pad missing down here. Um, so yeah, overall it turned out okay. I mean, I've got a sticker I stuck on here, P2 inputs fault. Um, it is just the start button. Um, the D button was um, the, the super gun. It was just that dry joint down the super gun. It could do with a bit more cleaning this. You know, the 
chips around here don't look particularly clean you know you get loads of uh, contaminants stuck between the pins and things here you can see that that's super dirty so I might clean it up off, off camera but uh, you know and you can see the the work I did here was pretty good as well uh, so yeah that board's had quite a lot uh, of things uh, done to it in general but uh, the majority of the fault here, well all of the fault, was just this chip. It was just the 259. And if you want to program up your own uh, diagnostics BIOS, I'll post a link down below to SMK Dan's webpage there where you can download, uh, I think it's version 9.19 at the moment, so that's version. You can download that ROM, uh, SP2 I think is the file you need, because uh, this 2, there's one for the M1, because you can. Uh, as I showed in one of my earlier videos, again I'll post a link down below, build a, a sound test uh, cart using one of your game cartridges by swapping out the M1 for a custom M1. And you use that in conjunction with the SP2 Unibio uh, sorry, SP1 Unibios here. Uh, so yeah, get the SP1 chip, uh, get yourself a 27C1024 or a 27C2048 and you could have two ROMs on there, perhaps a Unibios and the Diagnostics make it switchable using the upper address line. Just program it, stick your chip in there and you're away. The other thing I would just point out is with the Unibios you can skip past errors, you know, you can disable the error checking. So if you've just got purely a backup RAM error and you disable uh, that uh, self-test functionality in the Unibios there, or just skip past the error, you should in theory be able to boot a game to see what the graphics look like, is the sound okay, is the system actually working. And you can get unexpected behaviour when you've got uh, backup RAM problems like that and you've skipped past it. Uh, with the Unibos, because that's exactly what happened with me with my 1FZ. Uh, you know, where uh, you suddenly say game over in the middle of whilst you're playing, or you suddenly lose a life, weird things could happen. And I think it might be protection, I'm not sure, it might be the way the game is utilising the backup RAM as the game is, uh, you know, sort of playing out. Uh, you would think they would only use that for scores and things like that, but uh, yeah, it varies from game to game, and you can get unusual behaviour when you've got backup RAM and you skip past the, the error. Uh, but with a standard, uh, you know, uh, official ROM, you can't skip past the errors. It'll just come saying backup RAM and error, you know, whatever address, and you can't get past it. So there's a mileage there in having both the Unibars and uh, SMK Dan's Diagnostics uh, ROM. The uh, Unibars, it's only something like 25 euros registered, and then you get lifetime support. Every new version that RAS pushes out, you can, uh, you know, send him your serial number and a picture of you underneath your chip with the handwritten serial number on it, and he will send you out the latest version of the Unibars. So I would, you know, certainly recommend go to RAS's uh, website. Again, I'll post a link down below to that, and uh, purchase a license for the Unibars because you get the updates. I do hope you found that interesting, thank you very much for watching and I'll see you soon.